Thank you to the fourth annual Peter Benchley Ocean Awards. Um, we're very happy to have our winners and past winners here. We're going to start with a brief video that will give you some background and context to the Peter Benchley Ocean Award. And uh, we'll just start now. I'm Peter Benchley. When I wrote a novel called Jaws, I was faced with a fascinating challenge. How to describe the instincts of a beast that is so perfect that it has never needed to evolve. Well, to write about sharks is one thing, but to venture into their world is something else. From his early years, Peter's love and understanding of the ocean and its creatures came naturally and were reinforced throughout the rest of his life. He was one of our great ocean people, uh, bringing the ocean to the public in a way that they could access, in a way that they could get engaged with. Since 1960, hundreds of people have reached the summit of Mount Everest. More than a dozen astronauts have touched the surface of the moon, but only two men have reached the deepest part of the ocean. Peter never saw himself as an expert. So he sought the wisdom, counsel, and friendship of leading marine scientists and photojournalists. He immersed himself intellectually and physically in learning about Earth's largest, most important habitat from every vantage point. Diving and adventuring around the world, Peter and I witnessed the changes occurring in the sea. Forty years ago, we all thought that it was invulnerable. It was eternal. There was nothing man could do to, to destroy it or even to damage it. We thought all fish populations would come back. And they may, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. We joined with hundreds of others to work on the issues of overfishing, destruction of habitats, and using the ocean as a dumping ground. We know now that if we don't stop the decline, we may damage our planet irreparably economically, environmentally, and even existentially. Most important, we must begin to think differently about these wonderful creatures, to see them for what they really are. The Peter Benchley Ocean Awards are designed to carry forward his legacy and to honor outstanding achievement in a wide array of categories. The work you are doing is vital and extraordinary. I am pleased to celebrate the 2011 honorees. That just moves with this grace and power. I have no, I've never seen an animal like that in my life. You know, our Master of Ceremonies for the fourth annual Peter Benchley Awards, Her Deepness, Sylvia Earle. Thank you, David. I think you should get an award for pulling this masterful group together. <laughs> I have to say that I have had the pleasure of being a friend and a dive buddy of my hero, Peter Benchley. And it is such an honor for me to be here to help celebrate on his behalf, on Wendy's behalf, who's, you'll see her smiley face here in a moment, some other heroes that we are about to meet. Actually, you won't get to meet the individual who was the recipient of the first of the series here, the individual who received the Excellence in National Stewardship of the Ocean Award last night at the Inter-American Development Bank, and that was President Laura Chinchilla who is honored for her leadership in the conservation in her country, Costa Rica. I 
uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to uh, Mrs. Lynch and Mr. Helen uh, for having the time to meet to Costa Rica, not to allow us to see that to Costa Rica, this uh, very important distinction. I think my country deserves this. Thank you very much. I am truly honored to be here among friends and some of the world leaders in marine conservation to receive the first theater entries award for excellence in national stewardship of the ocean. Thank you for this award of distinction. And thanks to all the leading conservation organizations that are behind this award. The process leading to the declaration of the Simons Marine Management Area was a long and coordinated effort led by many individuals, environmental organizations, and state agencies. I proudly receive this prize in the name and foremost in name of the people of Costa Rica. Contributing to the protection of our natural heritage gives me great personal satisfaction, particularly when it refers to the waters surrounding Cocoa Island, a beacon of national pride and symbol of marine conservation for all Costa Ricans and visitors that have had the privilege of experience its greatness. So, if the president of every country had such an ethic, <laughs> well, we can hope. Presenting the next award, the Award for Excellence in Science, is another of my personal heroes. And never mind that they call him Dr. Doom. Ah, oh. <laughs> it's a terrible name for someone who is such a champion of the ocean. So, Jeremy Jackson, would you please come up here for the next award, to deliver the next award. Oh, I, I thought of a lot of things to say about Steve, but I guess I won't. Um, it's really fun, you know, being a professor and getting to see your, uh, your children basically grow up. and. Uh, turn into really good scientists and, 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 um, and develop, and then, of course, leave you in the dust, which doesn't always feel so good, but uh, yeah, I guess, I, I guess it does. Um, I met Steve as a sort of gawky, geeky, molecular biologist, sophomore, um, I think sophomore, um, who came and took my ecology class and I was so impressed, I took him to Jamaica to do field work, which I guess was more fun than being in a lab, and he utterly took over the project. And before he graduated as an undergraduate, he'd done the work for three um, papers, one of which he just reminded me, got me to Paris for Christmas, but the other two papers, which he's the first author of, are actually really good. Um, Steve then went on to do a, a doctoral degree with the great Bob Payne at the University of Washington, working on sponges, of all things, on Tatouche Island, and then to the University of Hawaii, where he went assistant associate full professor, to Harvard, where he did more great stuff, but he couldn't stand the weather, and so now he's uh, at Stanford, where he's the director of the Hopkins Marine Station, is on the board of the Ocean Solutions Group there, and, and all those things, you know. And, and during every step of his career, he's done really great uh, innovative science. His tool mostly are the, the standard tools of molecular genetics, which he's pushed very far to, uh, in particular, study things like how speciation occurs in the ocean, how species are maintained in the oceans. You know, really good, solid, basic stuff, the sea urchins He's worked on, he's made the model organisms of the field, but he's also worked on snails, whales, corals, and, and you name it. And in all of this, Steve is, is without question one of the half dozen leading greats in, in marine evolutionary biology and ecology, and I'm sure the academy will be knocking on his door soon and, and all that good stuff, but that's uh, not why we're here. 
Um, we're here to talk about going beyond being a really good scientist, to do things that actually make a difference in the larger world. And, um, and Steve has, has done that as well in, in many different areas of ocean conservation and, and management. Uh, I could go on and on. I promised David I'd do two minutes, and I think I'll be close. Um, there are three things in particular I want to talk about. The first is all the different ways that Steve has studied whales using molecular genetics. He's figured out probably better than anybody what is a breeding population and what isn't, which is really important for protection. Uh, he's estimated historic populations as being a good 10 times greater than we thought they were from old whale hunting data. And my all-time favorite is with a guy named Baker. He holed up in a hotel room in Tokyo and set up a molecular genetics lab and sequenced the whale meat from the fish markets around Tokyo and demonstrated that the majority of specimens they sequenced were from species that aren't supposed to be sold. Have you gone back to Japan recently? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it was just a stunning paper in science. Hey, it's illegal, I'm showing. Okay, the, the other thing Steve has done that really impresses me is that he's a, a public scientist in the true sense of the word, something that most scientists aren't anymore. And his role as a public scientist ranges from everything to the rather standard science of doing really good genetics to figure out where you should put your marine protected areas, um, to innumerable lectures and being in films and writing popular books like the evolution explosion to try and explain to the general public this absurd experiment we're doing with the future of life. Um, and, and then the third thing about Steve, which I don't know how he got it, because I thought I had imbued him with all my values, is that he is insufferably optimistic. <laughs> and, 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 and this extends to virtually everything he does. And um, it extends to the way he manages the Hopkins Marine Station. It extends to his wonderful, very happy book about the death and life of Monterey Bay. And as Nancy Knowlton and I have also tried to emphasize, there's an awful lot of success stories out there if you only talk about them, and Steve is really good at that. So congratulations, Steve. It really hurt not to say anything nasty. Well, thank you very, very much, Jeremy. Um, I won't tell any of those stories of mine either. Um, those are deals. Uh, well, it's, it's such an honor being here, just not, not only because of all of the, all the things that have happened and, and all the things that you have done, um, but the way we are all trying to pull together the future of, of the ocean. And, and any scientist works not in a vacuum. I've had lots of wonderful people working with me, Scott Baker, Jeremy mentioned, also Frank Cipriano, who really were in those hotel rooms at the same time. Um, trying to figure out how to do this work uh, and not get in trouble going in and out of customs, uh, but also blaze a trail and leave evidence behind that really made a difference to what whales were in the whale meat market. Um, I'd also like to say that, that no scientific career starts, uh, starts just at college, and I'm very happy to have my dad here. Um, and uh, there's a certain amount of... You can't believe all the bizarre stuff they let me do when I was young, like boiling away pots of seawater to see how much ocean salt was in them. Um, and, and that all makes a difference in growing up a scientist. We have to nurture that in, in people. Uh, I think that optimism that Jeremy mentioned is something I, I, I long to keep hold of. Uh, the Death and Life of Monterey Bay book is about an amazing success story. Monterey Bay, 80 years ago, was an industrial hellhole, and now you'd all love to live there. So how did that happen? And the fact that it happened and the people who did it is a really important story that Carolyn Sotka and I have told in a very nice book, I think, by Island Press. So um, success really matters to what we do because, in fact, that ocean we have out there is so amazing and so incredible. And if we can't keep it, it would be such a disaster. But we can. And we know we can, and we know some of the tools how. And so part of what we've tried to do in science is to develop those tools and try to lay them out. 
Uh, it would be interesting if we all took about 90 seconds to say what our awards mean not for the past and us personally, but what they might mean for the, for the future of the oceans. And in my case, it's, it's science. And, and if I spend 90 seconds on that, I'd say, well, there's two things. One is that science really should deliver information you can count on. That's our job. And it's tough to do that because what people want to count on is really different depending upon where they come. But science, when it's done well, says here's the information. Do with it what you will or what you can. And, and that's one of the roles I think we've tried to play. But the other role is something that's actually uh, kind of embodied by, by Sylvia. And that's that there's a great deal of discovery to be made, an incredible amount of wonder about the ocean. And science can, can pull that up can show it to you, and it can allow you to have just for a minute a sense of guiltless wonder about the fabulous things that there are in the ocean. And, and although the ocean's in trouble and we're working really hard to, to save them, let's let ourselves just find the ocean a wonderful, wonderful place. Thank you. The choice of the presenters, oh, by the way, is not just by chance. They are last year's winners who, as part of their, their winning, get to introduce this year's winner. And so, Dr. Jane Lubchenko, <laughs> would you please come forward and introduce for excellence in policy, Admiral Thad Allen. I have made many, many introductions in my life and had the pleasure of giving a few awards over time, but the opportunity to introduce and recognize Admiral Thad Allen is a very, very special one indeed. I really appreciate uh, you, Wendy, uh, and your establishment of these awards, and you, David, for organizing all of us, bringing us together, and for everyone joining us to celebrate Peter Benchley and his legacy. But tonight we are honoring, among others, Admiral Thad Allen. As John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and be more, you are a leader. Admiral Thad Allen has inspired numerous people, including myself, to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and to be more. He has taught us what it means to be a leader. I first met Thad Allen in June of 2009 when he hosted members of President Obama's Interagency Ocean Policy Task Force on a trip to tour the Alaskan Arctic so that we could better appreciate the beauty, the bounty, the people, and the issues of the far northern reaches of the country's ocean and coastal responsibilities. In the tiny village of Shishmaref, after passing out new white float coats to the villagers to keep them safe on the ice, he introduced a public health service vet who was there to doctor to the community's dogs. He then returned to our helicopter and proceeded to boot up his computer to establish a satellite link and send a tweet and a blog to share what we had done and learned in that community about the relationship of those people to the ocean and about their community needs and desires with a much broader audience. We have since become close colleagues and friends. 
and I am confident that this relationship will continue for many years to come. Thad's four decades of service to this nation began in 1971 when he graduated from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and where I am sure that his father would want me to share with you, he was a standout football player. <laughs> he received a Master of Public Administration degree from George Washington University and a Master's in Management from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Thad's career in the U.S. Coast Guard included numerous missions critical to our nation's security, maritime safety, and one of his passions, stewardship of the environment. Ultimately, Thad rose to the highest rank within the Coast Guard, serving as its 23rd Commandant until May 25th of last year. Five years ago, President Bush asked Thad to direct the federal response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, which he did with great sensitivity, panache, and tremendous success. In fact, each time I've been with Thad in New Orleans, and that's multiple times, complete strangers in restaurants, on the street, on the docks, come up to Thad and say, thank you, thank you. Last summer, President Obama called upon Thad for one final mission to serve as the National Incident Commander of the Unified Command for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I cannot imagine a more perfect fit for this job. Thomas Jefferson said, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. Through many of the difficult times in the Gulf, he stood like a rock. He stood on behalf of the people of the region. He stood on behalf of their safety and future and well-being. He stood there for the creatures of the Gulf, and he understood the connections among them. The Gulf region, and indeed the entire nation, owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude, Thad. The men and women of the Coast Guard, for whom I have the greatest respect, are forever indebted to you as well. And personally, it's been my honor to serve with you. And I'm even more honored to call you my friend. But you all should know that even in retirement, Thad continues to be a tireless champion. And of all of the things that he could focus his energy on, he has been working on oceans. He has been promoting the importance of scientific information to understand oceans, promoting the importance of stewardship, of using ecosystem-based approaches, of marine, of marine spatial planning, and of connecting people to place. So it's very fitting for him to be receiving this Peter Benchley Ocean Award for excellence in policy, for his work in the US Arctic, for his work in ocean policy, and for disaster response leadership. Please join me in congratulating and thanking Admiral Thad Allen. Sylvia Earle, Wendy Benchley, and Jane Lubchenco, I am blessed. I am blessed. Thank you all. David, where are you? Thank you. Oh, there you go. I got behind me. I will make it short. Uh, I delivered the commencement address this morning at George Mason University over in Fairfax County. And it wasn't the address they were thinking I was going to deliver. I did talk about leadership, uh, but I challenged them to think about what was happening in our world and their responsibility in it. And I stated very clearly to them that climate change is not a problem, it is a symptom. The problem is our behavior. We will only attack 
Black Swans and Wicked Problems. I'm sure you all know what those mean. Not the great movie by Natalie Portman. Uh, we can only attack these problems if we uh, create unity of effort. And there is no problem in this world that anybody can handle by themselves. The requirement to bring together people when you do not have legislative authority or jurisdiction over them, to collaborate, produce networks and partnerships that are effective in doing what this country believes needs to be done in a crisis can only be done through trust. Trust doesn't happen overnight, but it has to begin somewhere. And conversations like the ones that occurred today at our panel are very, very important to get the information out, but more importantly, to understand the frustration and the rage by some people that don't think these problems are being solved, that they're intractable and there's no way forward. That is not true. That is not true, and it is up to us uh, to create the art of the possible moving forward. Uh, that is the legacy of Peter Benchley. That is the legacy of the people that are standing behind me. That is certainly the legacy of my very good friend, Jane Lepchenko, and I'm honored to receive the award. Thank you. Imagine the distinguished Admiral Allen tweets and blogs. <laughs> <laughs> I hope all of you do too. Presenting the next award is Brian Scarry, who was the recipient of the same award for excellence in solutions. Oh no, sorry. What, what's that? Oh, this is a new. Oh, goodness. All right. <laughs> yes, all right. So, <laughs> this is a new award. Stand by. <laughs> For Dr. Greg Stone, who's lurking here somewhere, I believe. Um, this is Excellence in Solutions, and I think both of you have um, achieved great excellence in finding solutions. But first, we have to find Greg Stone. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Please. I, um, I didn't actually prepare remarks for this evening because I was expecting the world to end. Um, so I'm going to have to kind of shoot from the hip, I guess. Um, it's actually a, a special privilege to be here tonight for these Peter Benchley Awards. Peter was a real hero of mine, and uh, spending time with him in the field remains some of my fondest memories throughout my career. Peter was also a very dear friend of Greg Stone's, and I know that receiving this award is particularly moving for Greg because of all that it represents. As a photojournalist, I spend my life telling stories about the sea, both the good stories that celebrate the magnificence and the troubling stories that show the problems. And I believe we've come to a crucial time in history where we need many voices telling stories about the sea, and we need many heroes working on her behalf. We need scientists dedicating their lives to understanding the ocean and how it works. We need people that make laws to protect the ocean, people to enforce these laws. And we need artists of all disciplines to remind us why we should care. Greg Stone, is a rare combination of all of these things and more. Juggling multiple projects simultaneously, on any given day, Greg can be found creating conservation plans, leading underwater expeditions around the world, writing magazine articles and books, and meeting with everyone from world leaders to remote fishermen in locales in some of the most exotic places on Earth, just to further the cause. As a scientist, he spent countless years in the field gathering data and putting together key pieces of information to solve that grand oceanic puzzle. But the gift that Greg brings to marine conservation goes far beyond even all of those things. His greatest talent, I believe, is the ability to see the big picture, 
to take complex situations and boil them down to simple equations. Plainly stated, where most men see problems, Greg Stone finds solutions. And he possesses the skills to bring together the best people in a selfless way to deliver monumental results. In recent years, he has become perhaps best known for being the force behind the creation of the Phoenix Islands protected area in the Pacific, the world's, one of the world's largest marine reserves. And while he should indeed be celebrated for this tremendous feat, it is only one of many in a very long list of accomplishments that Greg has achieved. So tonight, it gives me great pleasure to recognize my friend Greg Stone for his profound vision and his consi consistent ability to deliver results for marine conservation by presenting him with this Peter Benchley Award. Greg? Thank you.